It is my great pleasure to introduce Mari Naomi. And I want to tell you, okay, this is their book. It is one of the most beautiful things I've ever held and felt. It has, it's like a very sensuous experience. Like the cover is fabulous. The inside pages are like slick and wonderful. It smells like ink. It's pretty great. It's also beautiful. So it is at Prairie Lights. There is going to be a book signing at 4.30. There are limited numbers of this. We were super, 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 super lucky to get it. So there's also, I'm kind of worried about saying this because I feel like everyone's going to run and leave early. So um, Mar Naomi also brought 10 copies of Turning Japanese. There are now eight <coughs> copies, I know for a fact, um, that are also available. So uh, pretty amazing um, possibilities there. Okay. So Marnie Emmy was born in Texas but raised in California and has been making comics for well over 25 years. They were inspired early on by the work of Mary Fleener, who wrote The Life of the Party in 1996, and the work and images of Ariel Bordeaux, who most recently published Clutter, a Scatterbrained Sexual Assault Memoir. Their own work was inspired by the experience of moving through the world as a queer person of color and a feminist. They entered the world of comics through the creation of zines and mini-comics. Um, and so Estrus Comics was wi a wildly popular seven-issue series that was the springboard for Kiss and Tell. So Kiss and Tell was the first book I ever read, um, and that was published in 2011. And I honestly was transported back to my own teenage years. Um, their work, which is mostly autobiographical, has always been an experience that sparks my own memories of relationships and desire. Their pieces are woven through with self-deprecation, bravery, honesty, humanity, and humor. I also love the way that they draw um, in lots of different ways of drawing. And um, after that, they followed up with Dragon's Breath, an intimate autobiographical piece Piece made of vignettes that stay with you, that explore race, queerness, coming of age, being an adult, childhood, working, and death. It's also a beautiful example of the range that Mari Naomi has in terms of their imagery and storytelling. Some stories are just flashes that leave you wanting more. Mari Naomi explores the idea of memory and what is real and what is imagined and what does it mean in the moment and what does it mean later. It's also about intersectionality and intersections of people. And if you are freaked out about bed bugs, don't read it. <laughs> they followed that with Turning Japanese, which is out of print because it was so popular. That's why I'm saying there are eight copies right now, only two blocks away, which is miraculous. Um, but I'm also very excited for April when the um, reprint is coming out, and it's an expanded version. So if anyone needs to get a birthday present for me, um, that is a possibility. <laughs> So um, then they wrote, I Thought You Hated Me, a brilliant idea for a story about friendship that spans three decades. This was followed up by the brilliant trilogy, Life on Earth. Right now, you should go out and buy multiple copies of this work about suburban teenagers, especially Losing the Girl, which was banned by illiterate homophobes in Texas who probably have not even read the book. Um, then they created Dirty Produce. Have you all seen Dirty Produce? And truly, Valentine's Day, like, I, you could not, it is, and it's the sweetest, most wonderful, funniest, I, I just, it's, I can't eat avocados and not think of these things anymore. So, um, it's filled with quirky illustrations, and it's a gem that will make you happy every time you read it. Um, we're very excited about your latest work, um, over 300 pages of beautiful images about a long-lost best friend. Um, and again, you can snag a copy today at Prairie Lights. Um, Joe Sacco is also going to be there signing books. Um, but I first want to point out that Marnie Amy is not just creating incredible books. Their work has also appeared in over 80 publications around the world, including one of my favorites, The Rumpus. In addition, their work has been in the LA Review of Books, BuzzFeed, Midnight Breakfast. Their art has been featured in institutions such as the Smithsonian, the De Young Museum, the Cartoon Art Museum, and the Asian Art Museum, and the Japanese American Museum. Their work is a reflection of who they are, prolific, brilliant, witty, beautiful, generous, and an amazing storyteller and image maker. They're also interested in connections and social justice. 
One of the most amazing contributions to the world of comics and art are the databases they have created and curated. Cartoonists of color, queer cartoonist database, and the disabled cartoonist database. This has opened an entire world of connections for artists, publishers, academics, event organizers, teachers, parents, and readers. This is an incredible act of generosity that will truly change the landscape of comics and the array of possible stories that are told in our world. Um, in 2021, they designed the powerful Stop AAPI Hate Mural that's in um, Garvey Park in California. Um, it's inspired by a comic strip, and the mural is 60 by 10 feet. Um, and it depicts a young Asian American reading Stop AAPI Hate, um, a tweet about a reported hate crimes, and then they realized that the number could be even higher because they were themselves a victim of a hate crime that they didn't report. Um, in the comic, their cat points out that America has scapegoated Asian and Asian American citizens for centuries. Um, this is just another amazing example of the ways that Mari Naomi's work has inspired retrospection into our own experiences, motives, and relationships with others and the world. And I hope you will warmly welcome them. under here. <clears throat> so uh, this, this uh, is, is meant to be um, funny. <laughs> so I, but I'm trying to cut out the self-deprecation and it's funny that you, you added it in there because I'm like, oh no, I'm trying not to be. Uh, what are you going to do? All right. <laughs> Oops. Oh gosh. And there we are. I'm so glad this is recording for posterity. So, <laughs> hi, thanks for coming. Um, so I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, and I had this idea, I'm putting on my air filter. I always had this idea that I was gonna be a superstar novelist right out the gate when I was a kid. Um, even though I didn't get a formal education, in fact, I dropped out of school um, because I didn't like being told how to learn. It's funny because I'm kind of a teacher now <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I read a lot and I practiced constantly and mo most importantly, I love writing. Um, when I was 18, I finished my first novel and then immediately got to work trying to find a publisher as well as starting my second novel, um, I wanted to have a bestseller before I was a washed up 21 year old. <laughs> I'm laughing under here. Um, long story short, I did not get those books, books published, um, thank God, because uh, they were not good. Uh, and I'm glad they're not following me around uh, all these years later. But during all this, I realized that the act of writing has very little to do with the act of publishing a book. Whereas writing felt like spiritual growth, uh, publishing felt like I was dying inside. Uh, so my lifelong dream was not what I thought it would be, and I kind of gave up on that around age 22. Uh, but I was still a writer at heart, so I sought out a career that could utilize my love of storytelling. Uh, I eventually fell into the video games industry. Um, it was the 90s, and games were starting to get cinematic. And the landscape felt so new and exciting and boundless. Uh, of course, I had to shift gears instead of a solitary career, clacking out prose on a typewriter whilst locked away in a sunlit, sparsely decorated attic. Uh, my work would be instructive dialogue written in to spreadsheets while sitting in cubicles. But, you know, you adapt. Um, I traveled a circuitous route from game tester to admin, to production, and ultimately to freelance game writing. Um, and it took me years to get there. And, uh, and for years afterwards, it's how I supported my arts career. Um, around the time I started working in games, I also started making comics. Uh, I'd been reading underground comics for a couple years by then. Uh, but it wasn't until I came across Diane Newman's anthology, Twisted Sisters, that I even thought about making them myself. I'm gonna try this little... Ah, ooh, hey, ah, yay. Um, the comics in this book were by kick-ass women talking about their wild lives, and their very existence gave me permission to do, um, put value on my own stories, and to potentially tell them and share them. Uh, specifically, Mary Fleener's comic, The Jelly, as pictured here, which is a story about her hot mess of a roommate, um, it flipped a switch in me. Um, I too had wild stories, but it had never occurred to me to write about them. 
uh, up to then, the only uh, memoir I was familiar with was celebrity memoir or extraordinary stories like the Diary of Anne Frank. So realizing that stories about regular people could also be considered important changed my perspective. Um, I dusted off my drawing skills, uh, became a comics-making fiend at that moment. I picked up the pencil in February of 1997 and put down the pen in March, and there was my first comic. I was 22 years old. There's my first comic. Um, it was a seven-page autobio story about an unrequited crush, and after this, I never stopped writing uh, and making art about complicated relationships. Uh, my early comics were done in the style that I developed as a teenager where, when I was obsessed with Edward Gorey, pointillism, and LSD. Um, I wore my micron pens down to split nibs. Um, once I had a handful of comics ready, um, I went to a convention, Ape, uh, to try to find someone to print them. I asked around, um, my comics clutched in my hand, and was steered towards the slave labor graphics table. They told me about Action Girl Comics, their floppy anthology edited by Sarah Dyer. I sent her an email, and she agreed to publish one of them if I agreed to make it more family-friendly, i.e. cover up the boobs. Uh, she published more of my comics in subsequent issues, and I found more anthologies to submit to over time. I was on the internet back then, but it wasn't like it is today. Um, if you wanted to find new creators or find an audience, you really had to go to anthologies to do so. Um, at the same time, I started collecting my comics into zines and selling them at conventions under the name of Estrus Comics. Here they all are. Um, at first, I only made like 25 at a time. I'd um, use my work... Uh, copy machine at Sega. Um, I gave them to friends and I sold them at conventions. And the more I made, the bigger my audience and print runs got. Um, but they were still just a hobby, just a creative outlet, which were, was keeping me sane as I pursued a more corporate writing career. If ever I daydreamed about, about my comics being something else, it was of getting my own floppy series through an indie comics publisher like, I don't know, Fantagraphics and making more pen pals, like those were my goals. But I was in no hurry. Um, in fact, I didn't even know what I would want to make a series about. So my work has been all over the place, especially in those years. Uh, memoir, fictions, poems, and gags. I was just messing around. I consider those to be my practice years when I was developing my voice. The more comics I made, the more my drawing style developed. Um, looking back, I see that many of the changes to my style were a result of me trying to do more in less time. I still loved and do love detailed art, Joe Sacco, um, but <laughs> if I wanted to tell a full story, I needed to get faster, and that meant cutting corners. Instead of spending hours stippling a single panel, I had to use my time economically creating simpler drawings. Um, man, that was from 99, wow. So in 2003, a theme finally came to me. And uh, this was the first comic I did for it. My dating life was in a bit of a shambles, and I wanted to examine where I was going wrong. What if I made a comic examining every romantic experience I'd had up till then? Maybe a project like this would help me see the bigger picture. I floated the idea past one, my one comics friend, but he didn't think anyone would be interested. At this time, people still felt that comics were for boys, just that, like they thought video games were for boys. Uh, relationship comics didn't fit that mold, but I didn't really care if people wanted to read them. I still wanted to make them. Um, this was the first uh, comic I made for Kiss and Tell, but it never actually got included in the book because I capped it at age 22. Uh, in a few years, folks actually started noticing graphic memoirs by women. Uh, Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis was published in the U.S. in the early aughts, and Alison Bechtel's Fun Home was published in 2006. So floppies were out and books were in. So I started dreaming about collecting my dating, stor dating stories into a tome with an actual literary publisher. But even though a long time had passed, I was still traumatized from the time I tried to publish a novel. Um, I didn't want to do this alone. So I had made more friends in comics by this point. People I met with to draw with, talk, and just be dorky with. Community. 
One of them had an agent, so I meekly asked them for a referral. I wrote to the agent asking if he knew of anyone who might represent a small potato like me, and I was surprised that he took me on. For maybe a year, my new agent and I had meetings with various publishers, like I had multiple conversations with Little Brown, who said my book proposal was too mature for their readers, but would I be interested in making a young adult or YA graphic novel? Um, this was 2009, so Smile by Raina Telgemeier wasn't out yet, so like things were still fairly new in this realm at the time. Um, I didn't actually know what that would look like. Um, I'd never read Young Adult as a kid, um, nor did I know anyone who did. Um, so the editor sent me a box of prose books, since there weren't really a lot of graphic novels yet, um, and I poured over them and said, sure, why not? I'm up for it. Uh, I came up with a pitch for losing the girl at that time um, that they ended up rejecting, um, but more on that later. Uh, Eventually, Kiss and Tell got picked up by Harper Perennial. At this point, I'd started to get a peek into the publishing industry from the inside. I was a small fish in a big pond. For example, the same day Kiss and Tell was coming out, Harper was also publishing Justin Bieber's memoir. It was clear that although Harper Perennial was printing my book and lending me a publicist, most of their resources would be focused elsewhere. So I was ready to work. Another thing that concerned me was putting these very personal stories out there for anyone to see. My parents, for example. This is a book about my sex life. Um, they'd only seen my tamer works up to that point, but a lot of what was in the book was stuff they didn't know about and had never experienced themselves. Orgies, drugs, blowjobs, probably. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Um, we had a rocky past, but we were finally getting along. I didn't want to mess that up. So immediately after I signed the contract, I got to work on my parents. I had a year to convince them not to read my books. <laughs> um, but it wasn't just my folks. I remember one day in my editor's office, I'd finished drawing everything, and my pages were laid out in a binder on her desk, which is how I used to envision how my books would end up looking. Um, there's, uh, there's me. It was open to this. Uh, one of the last pages in the book where I draw myself as a naked butterfly, it was a metaphor, and we were talking about the next steps. When we talked about the protagonists of my book, um, literally me, we talked about them in third person, but suddenly I was very aware that it was my naked body on the page that my editor was resting her elbow on. She had just told me how many books were going to print, something like 10,000. I looked down at where her elbow was resting and tried to wrap my head around 10,000 people seeing my puss. <laughs> That's a lot of people, I probably said. And she gave me a reassuring smile and said, don't think about it, worry about it later. Um, it was too late to turn back, so I shoved that thought aside and have uh, remained in denial till this day about it. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so back to my parents. I was determined to keep them from reading my book. This was actually about, um, this is supposed to symbolize my first LSD trip. Um, my mom has over, only ever kissed my dad and is scandalized about anything sexual. Um, the problem is my mom is also very curious. Uh, I probably got my love for making visual art from her, and my dad is an aspiring novelist, so they were proud of me of getting this far. Of course they wanted to read the book. Um, so I had to get strategic. Whenever they started getting nosy, I'd feed them bits of new, vulgar information. Like, one time I described to them, panel by panel, the comic about my first blowjob, and how the boy had probably never washed under his testicles ever. I described the flies I'd drawn coming out of his area. Is that really something you want to see? I asked my mom, and that shut her up for a little while. When Kiss and Tell finally came out, my plan worked for a bit. Um, my dad did read it, um, but he said it took him like a year to get through, and it's like a three-hour book, really. Um, he had to keep putting it down because it was too much. <laughs> uh, finally, after a few years, my mom's curiosity got the best of her, so she picked it up, according to my dad, read five pages, and then put it down for good, so far. <clears throat> anyway, back to publishing. Um, it wasn't long after my contract was signed that the big five publishers started to realize that Fun Home was kind of a fluke and comics for adults weren't necessarily going to be their next big cash cow. 
Um, about six months after I signed the contract, which was six months before my book was published, most of the big publishers put a halt to snatching up graphic memoirs by women. So I got in there just under the gun. I was really lucky, or under the wire gun. Anyway, uh, so by the time my book came out, some of the graphic novel fervor had died down. Um, but even so, I did my best to get it out there. I went on tour. I tabled at least one convention for, um, per month for over a year all of it on my own dime. I juggled three simultaneous web comics, not to mention all the commissions and speaking engagements I was suddenly getting. Uh, like here's one of my web comics um, for a no local news site in San Francisco. Uh, it was, I started it because I wanted to write off a restaurants from my taxes um, and expense them, um, but it expanded it to include mom and pop businesses I wanted to boost in my community, such as I did one about my wonderful, wonderful dentist who is retired now, but like it really bonded us. It was like you could really make comics to like connect with people and also to make them like you. But that's the lesson today. Um, people will like you if you make comics. Uh, so Kiss and Tell came out in 2011, two years after I got married to my sweetheart. Uh, by 2012, I was so busy with comics work, I had to make a decision. Um, he and I talked about it, and I asked, would you rather be married to, to a well-off games writer or a starving cartoonist? He, with a stable games job and benefits that extended to me, said, why don't you give comics a chance? So the decision was made. I broke up with video games. Um, only I didn't have a time to turn down my next assignment. At the same time I decided to break up with games, um, my clients magically dried up. Um, I would have been out of a job either way, but the important thing is that I broke up with it first. <laughs> so back to publishing. Um, I had read that after a book comes out, it has about three months to make it or break it, um, and that'll determine your career from that point forward. But it's not really possible to know your true numbers until like a year into publishing a book. Um, so after one of the busiest years of my life, I learned some horrifying news. Of the 10,000 books they printed, they'd barely even sold 1,000 after a whole year. My publisher, who had turned down, who had first rights of refusal for my second memoir, Turning Japanese, turned it down. My editor said she loved it and was upset when it got rejected for not being universal enough. Uh, the way she said it, I got the feeling she was implying they meant it was too ethnic. Um, now, this was before it was in vogue to tell diverse stories. Most gatekeepers weren't interested in Asian American stories until, oh, when did Crazy Rich Asians come out in the movies? About 2018. So I had like six more years to go. Um, my agent wasn't having any luck pitching it, uh, probably because of the poor sales of Kiss and Tell. Um, and also just they, they weren't buying as many graphic novels or memoirs at the time. Um, and he started suggesting publishers that I just wasn't into. It was around, around then that we'd agreed to part ways and suddenly I was a free agent, um, a failed free agent. But by this time I had lots of material. Um, even though my book had failed, my web comics were doing really well and I built an audience. Um, I was churning out so many comics during that time I had another book, enough for another book, um, plus turning Japanese, plus the young adult pitch, I had like three books. Um, and from all my travels, I'd made a bunch of contacts, so I thought, who needs an agent? I reached out to one of the publishers I'd met um, in New York who told me to send him my pitches, and I did. And his response, I still have the email where he said, have you considered self-publishing? Not only did he not want to publish my books, he didn't think anyone would, and despite my 14 years of making comics, it was clear he had no idea who I was. And this is when I realized I'm too sensitive not to have an agent. So I ended up signing with Gordon Warnock, who still represents me today, and I met him on Twitter. Uh, my next book contract I had was for turning Japanese, the one my previous publisher turned down for being too ethnic, or whatever. Um, I met the guy, uh, guys of 2D Cloud at a convention in Minneapolis, and then, um, and then I worked on a story for one of their anthologies, and then we bonded over some of the video games I made that they loved. Um, in fact, that's probably why they wanted to publish me. Oh gosh, that's so self-deprecating. I mean, my book is awesome, and they wanted to pu publish it. Um, but for various reasons, Turning Japanese didn't end up coming out until years after we signed the deal. So Dragon's Breath and Other True Stories ended up being my next book, even though I drew it after. 
So back when I was trying to promote Kiss and Tell, I came across an advice column in The Rumpus, an online literary magazine. Dear Sugar was written by an anonymous person who managed to take the advice letters and turning, turn them into storytelling devices for her own stories. Um, the column was beautiful, heartbreaking, and just brilliant. It's been turned into a uh, book called Tiny Beautiful Things, by the way. Uh, for the past year, folks had asked me how I'd managed to write such honest work in Kiss and Tell, and I blushingly accepted the compliment. But reading Dear Sugar, I realized it was all a lie. My comics were embarrassing and sometimes sad or funny, but I hadn't ripped my heart open and shown people my guts, not at all. But I wanted to, and I wanted to find out who this anonymous writer was, buy her books, and become her friend. So I concocted a plan. I noticed that the Rumpus had a comic section and that a bunch of my friends were on there. Digging around, I discovered the Rumpus didn't pay. Um, they were pretty picky about what they published. They had a strong community in the moderated comments, and I got the information for the comics editor, Paul Madonna. Inspired by Dear Sugar, I approached him with a pitch of, of about a dozen comics ideas that eventually ran on the Rumpus on my website, webcomic, Smoke in Your Eyes. Back then, I drew everything ink on paper, and up till then, it was intended to be read on paper too, but I adjusted. I taught myself how to format my comics for the screen, arranging them as a scroll, making the scroll a part of the pacing, much like a page turn would be with a book. Uh, Paul suggested I had written enough comics about romantic relationships, so I went in other directions. I wrote about a teacher who died and was forgotten by most of the school. I wrote about the declining mental health of an old houseless friend, about my alcoholic grandpa, about various little moments of growing up. I dug deep, trying to find stories that would make me cry and translate them into stories that would make you cry. Um, if, if I could make my spouse tear up, I knew I had a winner. If he was like, this is good, I was back to the drawing board. So Cheryl Strayed came out as the author of Dear Sugar before my plan could go to fruition. Um, and I have met her and she's super nice. I like to think we're a form of friends, even if that form is me worshiping her and, and her occasionally liking my Instagram posts. Um, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> Um, during this time, not only was I working my butt off drawing web comics, I was learning how to promote them on social media. I studied so many platforms and had hits and misses and misses. Like, I abandoned 4chan pretty quickly, um, but I had good luck on Reddit, Tumblr, and StumbleUpon. It was a crash course on growing a thick skin. There's my grandpa comic. Um, I kept meaning to collect my Rumpus comics in zine form, but I didn't have the time because I was just drawing too much. And soon I had over 300 pages of material, too much for a zine. I was told that it's hard to get publishing deals for short story collections, so I decided to publish it as a book myself. Um, but self-publishing comes with some setbacks, such as distribution and not being eligible for awards. Um, so I went to my new publisher's 2D Cloud to see if I could put their name on it to help with those matters. I was delighted when they offered to publish it for me. They said, let's consider this a test run before we print Turning Japanese. They were a micro press at the time seeking to grow. Um, and once I got 2D Cloud on board, my agent agreed to help with a contract and suddenly I had a bona fide second book. Bam. This little book that I thought nobody wanted ended up getting a lot of attention. Maybe it's because of the web comics and the marketing I'd done over the past year, or maybe it was my viral XO Jane article, or maybe it was because I'd recently started my databases, more on that in a second, or maybe it's because it was actually good, but for whatever reason, Dragon's Breath got on the map and it got nominated for an Eisner Award. This is something I never thought would happen or even wanted, and as much as I hate the concept of awards, it felt annoyingly validating to get nominated. <laughs> Um, so about the databases, I wrote a little comic about them, and I'm just going to read this off for you. Um, comics are for white men. 1998. It's Mari. We love your comics. I love your comics, too. 2002. It sure is nice to have a comics friend and a Japanese-American one at that. He's the guy who told me not to do Kiss and Tell, but I still love him. 2004. These are all by white dudes. Face it, Mari. Comics are for white men. 2006. 
Here's a friend telling me, I don't want to be known as a Chinese cartoonist. And a white dude saying, hey, is this manga? 2011, they turned down your book. They said it's not universal enough. Is that code for too ethnic? 2014, 50 female cartoonists you must read now. They left out the word white, stupid internet. And a friend said, do you want to write for our magazine? And I said, what's the topic? Anything you want. I want to write about race. Up to this point, whenever I'd wanted to write about race, it was kind of discouraged, so it was exciting to have this opportunity. So here's me researching people of color in comics. It was for an article I did of how to write people of color if you happen to be a person of another color. It was on Midnight Breakfast. Um, if, if you ever want to write outside of your ethnicity or whatever, I suggest you read it. Um, so after some research, I came up with one measly website that said, five black dudes who draw superheroes. And so I started writing down, who do I know? Jason, Lark, Keith, Witt, only 34 people. Maybe that jerk was right. Maybe comics are for white men after all. So I went to the internet. Help me, Twitter. Who are the people of color in comics? Tap, tap, tap. 60 replies. Wow. There's too many names. Better make a spreadsheet. Tap, tap, tap. I just make spreadsheets for everything, though, I'll admit. Oh, my God, there must be 100 of us. Someone really ought to put an online database together. Dun, dun, dun. If I don't do it, no one will. Sigh. Tap, 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 tap. Thus, the cartoonists of color, then the queer cartoonists, and the disabled cartoonist databases were born. Today, there are thousands of comics creators listed in the databases. The databases are used by all sorts of comics-loving folks, such as readers, booksellers, academics, curators, and publishers, for visibility, for academia, for inspiration, and for community building. All right, back to publishing. It wasn't until 2016 that Turning Jap Japanese came out. I had finished it so long before, it was weird to have to talk about it like it was brand new to me as if I remembered why I made all the choices I had. While I was promoting my old new book, I was traveling around to cons and I wanted more copies of Kiss and Tell to sell. But when I called to order more from HarperCollins, it was all sold out, all 10,000 copies. That three month make it or break it rule, rule was BS. It was then that I realized that the rules of how to have a successful book were not unlike the rules of dating, completely ridiculous and often wrong. So let me talk about Turning Japanese. This book is about the year or so before I started making comics, before my video game career really got off the ground. I was working as a bar hostess in San Jose attempting to learn Japanese, all in preparation to go to Japan and spend time with my mother's side of the family. But it would be different than the other times I'd seen them because this time I'd speak to them directly without my mom as a translator, who I suspected she was kind of editing out my personality when she translated. Um, this story was partly about hostess culture, but it was also trying to connect, about me trying to connect with the Japanese side of me, something I'd never successfully done up to that point. It was an adult coming of age story in that I was learning about cultural and generational differences, as well as a travelogue with me as an outsider in a culture that was also supposed to be mine, sort of. I had been trying to write about the hostess bars since I started making comics, around the time it was all happening, but I kept getting stuck. At the end of the day, even the most unusual job ends up being just a job, i.e. tedious and kind of boring. Um, and it wasn't until I connected it with my trip to my grandparents that it got its depth. I had been trying to write about the culture as an intrigued outsider, but it was really my inside knowledge and experiences that made the story more vibrant. So back to Dragon's Breath. Even though it came out before turning Japanese, it was drawn afterwards. One thing reviewers noted about Dragon's Breath was my minimalist art. This was both deliberate and by necessity. With turning Japanese, I sometimes drew out entire scenes and then erased much of it or inked only the necessary elements. Like sometimes, sometimes I need to show the whole background in order to give a sense of place, whereas sometimes a full background can be distracting and the reader wouldn't know where to look. With turning Japanese, I got in the habit of teasing out which visual elements were necessary and which weren't. And so by the time I was doing rumpus comics, I was more intuitive about the process, less erasing. 
Also, I was going so fast because there are only so many hours in a day and I was working all of them. So by the time I was making web comics, I was homing in on the absolute essentials of each story and leaving out the rest. I really like this method of storytelling as it's simple to follow, and it could also feel slower, spookier, and more poignant to have no panels or lots of empty space. Also, since I wasn't getting paid, I felt less urgency for my Rumpus comics to be perfect. It was a good excuse to play around and try new tools or techniques out. Like sometimes I'd love them and I'd carry on to carry the techniques on to new comics, and sometimes I would just try something once and let it be. Um, here's one, like I was trying out a new set of markers for that co this comic, and I never used them again afterwards, but I really like how they captured this one story. My next book was I Thought You Hated Me. I met the retrofit comic guys at a convention in Toronto, and when they approached me a couple years later to publish a comic with them, long or short, about whatever I wanted, I was thrilled. I'd been doing web comics for a while now, and I was ready to think bigger. I made myself stop fixating on my readers and what they wanted, which is a problem I developed while publishing online, and um, put some thought into what I wanted to make. I decided that I wanted there to be more comics about friendship, and I came up with a book about a complicated long-term friendship with my childhood bully, told in vignettes, who eventually became my best friend. My next project was my Life on Earth trilogy. My agent had been pitching book one, Losing the Girl, for years to no avail. Remember that this was the book that Little Brown asked me to come up with, but then they didn't buy it. So according to my agent, publishers were interested in the story, but not the art, because it was too different. Big publishers don't like taking chances with something new. Let me explain. Back in 2009, I was going through a crisis. I'd recently found out that someone I, I used to care about had not been what she seemed. This news really messed me up, but it was too early for me to process it in the form of memoir, so I poured all that energy into this pitch. I based a character on my ex-friend and tried to see the world through her eyes, and this is how I came up with the concept of the book, which was a teenage drama about relationships and maybe an alien abduction, but primarily it was an experimental comic about looking through different people's eyes. The book is written and drawn with each chapter coming from a different protagonist's perspective and drawn in a different style depending on their point of view. The styles even change up as the characters change and grow up. <clears throat> when I came up with this idea in 2009, as far as I know, no one had ever done this before in a graphic novel. And I don't actually know if anyone's done it since. Um, and it reminded me of why I love the comics medium so much. Comics are a place where, all by yourself, you can be a pioneer and invent new languages and techniques. It hasn't been done before, necessarily, and there's plenty of room to grow. Unfortunately, my publishers weren't as excited, the publishers, as I was about trying something new. The feedback my agent was getting was like, can she keep this story but draw it all in the same style? I guess I could have published it earlier, but the whole point for me was the shift in, in styles and perspectives. The lens of empathy to me was the whole point of the book and the whole point of art even. And this is how art can change humanity for the better and ultimately bring world peace. So no, I did not want to keep the story and draw it in just one style. Um, so it took a long time to find the right publisher. In 2016, an editor, so we'd been shopping this around for seven years, an editor asked if I would retweet something to my cartoonists of color Twitter. It was a call for YA graphic novel submissions, and I was like, hey, I have a graphic novel pitch for young adults, and that's how I found my next publisher. It turns out that he was a fan of Dragon's Breath, so much that he bought copies for, for all his friends, so he totally got my work. Because he shared my vision, he was kind of the perfect editor. Much of what he ended up doing was guiding me through what might be considered offensive to the gatekeepers of young adults. I removed swear words or fought hard for the ones I thought were essential. This make me, made me really put thought into why I believe something was necessary to the story. Sometimes it wasn't and sometimes it was. I took out many suggestive scenes. It was rough, but we didn't want the book to get banned or anything. At, the, at my request, dun, 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 we hired a sensitivity reader. Uh, one of my protagonists, Nigel, was black. I based him off of some boyfriends I had in high school, and I felt pretty good about how I was portraying him, but there was still some doubt. 
My past work had mostly been memoir, and it had been a long time since I tried to tell a story from someone else's perspective. What, was that? what if I was doing it all wrong? The sensitivity reader came back with some notes. There were some things that made me think about race more and why I'd made the decision I, decisions I had. It was helpful, thought-provoking, and I highly recommend it for anyone writing outside their experience, racial or otherwise. Um, but the biggest concern he had was that there'd be problems because of the interracial relationships. Well, being mixed race, all my relationships are interracial, so that was a hurdle I was familiar with. So book one, Losing the Girl, came out to great reviews in 2018. Um, great critical reviews. I peeked at Goodreads, I know, and noticed that certain adults were offended by surprising things, like one complained that there weren't any good father figures in the book. Another was upset that one of my characters was not a good person. I don't write good or bad person. I try to write nuanced because that's what people are, nuanced. And although some of my characters do grow into better people over the course of the trilogy, some do not. Um, but you can see what's going on in their heads and maybe feel a little empathy. Um, but my editor was right. YA gatekeepers could be brutal. But what I was really worried about was the kids. I didn't know any children, and I hadn't known kids who read young adult books when I was a kid, so I had no idea how that would even go. After book one, book one came out, I taught a comics workshop at the Bronx Library. Honestly, I had reservations. I don't really know how to be around kids. Um, luckily, there was a librarian there to help me out. I had a feeling that most of the kids were there for the free snacks, not to see me, which is fine. Um, one girl was so tough and wary, not unlike me when I was her age. It wasn't until we were winding down that the librarian brought out a rolling tray filled with my books and announced that I was the author and illustrator. Suddenly, the whole mood shifted. The kids freaked out, yelling about how great the book was, and they couldn't believe I wrote and drew it. And the tough little girl grabbed me and gave me the biggest hug. Oh, so uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> Book two came out in 2019. It got some attention in the press, but I didn't tour. I was going to go all out for book three, which I was in the middle of drawing. When we created the schedule, I, it stretched out for years. Much of book one was already completed, so it was mostly about books two and three. I was concerned that I was only getting a year to draw the third book, but I tried not to worry about it. It's not like I had a day job to distract me. I just get it done. Um, it wasn't easy. Even with a new iPad to speed up the process, even with all the pages laid out, just having to draw it was so hard. At the end of every day, I did the math to see how far along I was, and every day I seemed to fall further behind, even though I was working nonstop. As we got closer to the deadline, it seemed impossible. It looked like I was going to be late. I'm never late. I asked my publisher for three more months, and he was able to give me three more days I was so screwed. I canceled all the plans I was allowed to. I hunkered down and I drew. I drew so much my drawing hand was constantly aching. I put ice on it every night to get some relief. I drew so much that strange things happened to my body. <laughs> this is kind of gross. Um, a lump formed on my neck the size of a golf ball. I showed it to a friend when we were at this all-day conference I couldn't get out of and recall the horror on her face when I said I didn't have time to see a doctor. <laughs> okay, if you've read my work, you know I love body horror, so I love telling this story. Anyway, I had long hair, so I was able to cover it from the audience. <laughs> um, uh, but I drew so much that I started to hate drawing and hate comics and hate life. Um, I did end up making the deadline, but instead of victorious, I felt demolished, and I never wanted to make a comic again. By the time the book came out, maybe almost a year later, I was in a better place. The lump in my neck went away, um, and I was rested, and the book was getting great reviews, and I was excited to launch the trilogy into the world with a big old book tour. I even agreed to schedule school events, I did two bookstore readings and then everything shut down. My tour was canceled for the coronavirus. It was March 2020. So the book flopped. I can't tell you why or if my tour would have made a difference. My agent said it was thanks to the pandemic that the audience for this book tends to find their reading on library bookshelves and all the libraries were closed. I don't know if he was just being nice because I do have friends whose YA books did just fine during the pandemic. Maybe it was the exact timing. 
um, had it come out months earlier or, or later, maybe I would have been in a sweet spot for all the virtual events that were popping up, um, but I'll never know. I tried to do some online promoting, but it felt so awful when people were dying. I didn't want to promote my book. Um, and I was going through some stuff myself. That'll be in a book someday. <laughs> um, so one day in October 2021, almost two years later, a bookseller I'd been talking to gave me some unsettling news. They weren't able to order my books. I did some research and found out that despite their promise of being perennial, Harper Perennial had stopped printing Kiss and Tell. And Turning Japanese was out of print. But the worst was my Life on Earth series, which I still had dreams of touring once the pandemic was over. I, told that, I was told that the series had been pulped. It didn't even exist anymore. And I hadn't even gotten my author's copies. I was devastated. At the time, my agent and I were ta in talks with another publisher. Um, we'd done a lot of work on a pitch, but now I realized that the failure of all my books was gonna hurt me financially. My agent told me not to worry. After a couple more books, you can get back to where you were, he said. This will just hurt your next couple of advances. That was it for me. I was like, how many books do you think I have it left in me? I told him I was done. Um, I was not interested in starting over. I asked him to pull the pitch. After some conversation, I conceded that although I did not want to draw this graphic novel, I might be willing to write it. Um, I do write fast. The drawing is the hard part for me. Um, and would, a publisher be, would the publisher be open to getting an illustrator? Um, and they were reluctant, but asked who would I want to illustrate it. I thought about it and then reached out to my dream collaborator, an illustrator turned graphic novel artist and writer. Uh, Trung Le Nguyen once tweeted that one of my books had inspired him to start making autobio. He's a superstar now with his amazing book, The Magic Fish, Taking Over the World, so I didn't think he'd have the time or the inclination, but holy crap, he said yes. Um, so our book is scheduled to come out with Little Brown in 2026. Um, it's a middle grade graphic novel about non-binary J-pop stars befriending a half Japanese girl and helping her realize her creative dreams as well as come to terms with her heritage, yay. Um, so back to my failed trilogy. In November 2021, a month after I found out that my books were out of print and pulped, I got a text from a friend. Did you know your book got banned? <laughs> she asked me. Gah. She sent me an LA Times article that described how a woman in Katy, Texas had gotten losing the girl pulled off the shelves in their school district due to LGBTQ content. This was weird because the queer content didn't even begin until book two, but book one was the one they banned. Did she even read it? I was born in Texas and this felt personal and also my career was just demolished and now you're banning me. Um, it was clear that she was after this book because I'm queer and not because the book was. Um, so I used to joke that I wanted to be banned because um, it was a badge of honor and would help sell the books. Um, but I mean, it's not exactly true. Most books that get banned don't end up in the LA Times. Um, they just quietly disappear and then maybe so do the author's careers. Um, but that's not what happened this time. Due to the ban, suddenly everyone wanted to read the book. Um, but the book had been pulped. So I went to my editor and suggested maybe we should put it back into print. And that's what happened. And uh, magically, Kiss and Tell got back into print too. And Turning Japanese is about to be back in print this year through Oni Press. And um, thank you, Katie Texas. Um, you broke my heart, but you revived my career. Um, so there are two more books I want to talk about. Dirty Produce, mentioned earlier, is a book of erotic fruits and vegetables. Um, I came up with the concept in 2015 when I was making art for Giant Robot's annual Post-It Art Show. Uh, this show features hundreds of artists and the art is super cheap. It's really more about community and having fun than it is about making money. Um, here is some of the art that I made for that show. These did so well on social media that I decided to make them into a zine. There's the zine. I didn't make a lot of them, but people kept talking about them and my agent really wanted me to turn them into a pitch. So I gave in and put it together. Um, but it was too dirty for certain publishers and not dirty enough for other publishers. <laughs> Publishing sucks, man. <laughs> 
So in 2017, The New Yorker hired El Emma Allen who, as its new comics editor. Um, Emma began opening a doors to a lot of creators who hadn't previously been invited in, it, the best kind of gatekeeper. And about a year later in 2018, she approached me asking if I had anything I wanted to submit. This was actually a dream of mine, but I never honestly thought it would happen. Um, unfortunately, all my gags got re rejected until I showed her my dirty produce pitch and she loved it, but their contract was pretty restrictive um, and would give them all my rights. And that wouldn't work since we were trying to sell it as a book. Um, so might we draft a new contract for such a situation? Uh, my agent, Blossom, worked with them for a year before I managed to get my hands on the contract. And I swear to God, less than a month after it appeared in The New Yorker, I had a book deal. Bam. Which is funny um, because Workman's Press had previously turned down the pitch, but that editor left and the new one loved it. So that's a testament to my wonderful agent's persistence. Uh, Gordon Warnock highly recommended five stars. Um, Dirty Produce came out in 2021. There were a lot of pandemic-related problems, including my books getting stuck at a port overseas. Uh, much of the marketing got canceled, it sucked, but the best part was making the book. Unlike the memoirs I've worked on, which sometimes feel like ripping open old wounds, drawing my dirty produce was pure fun. I would talk about it with friends and text them sketches to make them laugh. I sat giggling for hours as I drew them. It was an absolute blast. Yes, that bean is farting. So this last book I'm gonna talk about, um, is I Thought You Loved Me, and actually when we went by Prairie Lights, there were actually only two books left there, so sorry. Um, but this technically comes out in May. Um, so remember the friend I based my Life on Earth trilogy on, uh, the one who wasn't what she had seen, seemed like at the time. Um, by 2016, I was finally ready to write about her head on. Um, it had been seven years since I'd found out about her betrayal, spoiler, and I was sick of being mad at her, but for some reason I just couldn't let it go. Um, I probably should have thought, sought therapy, but instead I wrote this book. This one was different from all my others in many ways. For one, I had gotten into digital art and was going crazy with collage, um, which I used as part of the storytelling. I always have loved collage, but new technology made it a lot more accessible than before, um, mostly due to hand paint and scissors. Um, this image is actually a mix of a life-size paper collage, um, but then I've altered it for digital collage around it. Another difference was that I was embarking on this project without a vision of what it would end up like. Um, all I knew that was that I was ready to delve into this part of my psyche and ready to make the art. I got a cork board and put it in the workspace I'd set up in my dining room. I was trying to piece together my relationship with this person, which had ended so long before, and figured out what went wrong. This cork board in the dining room ended up being a disaster because every time I ate a meal, I'd look over and there are all these post-its with bad memories on them, um, so I had to move that. Um, eventually, I got a studio, and that's where my creative, studio, uh, stu my creative juices got flowing. Um, so the book, bless you, uh, went from an exploration of my past into a mystery memoir with twists and turns that I didn't see coming. Um, I Thought You Loved Me has had an even rougher start than all of my other books. I got a publisher, I lost the publisher, I got another publisher, we had to crowdfund my book, oh my god. I had to cancel my book tour, the book's date keeps being pushed forward, it too got stuck on a port in Hong Kong. But it's the first book of mine to ever get a starred review, two in fact, and it's the first book I've ever not hated. Um, I know it sounds weird, but each time I reread it, I expect to hate it, just like I've hated pretty much all my books at some point. But each time I think, I wish I'd had a book like this when I was going through this. Um, I want it to be out in the world because I want there to be more books about friendship still. Like, I want whole sections of bookstores for about friendships. Like, I think it's really important. I want it to be successful because it's a weird, weird book, and I want to give others permission to make weird, weird books. Um, if it does well, it'll open doors to others. Publishers hate taking chances, big ones at least, but if something is successful, it's no longer a chance they're taking. I want more bisexual stories, more mixed race stories, more collage stories. I want to give new ideas more chances. 
Um, throughout all this, I've stayed true to my roots. I still self-publish zines. I also still make work for anthologies, like this one I drew for Drawing Power. In 2018, Mary Fleener told me Diane Newman was putting together another anthology. Remember them? Diane published the anthology Twisted Sisters and Mary made the jelly comic that made me start making comics. Well, one thing about comics is that if you stick around a lot enough, you'll get to know pretty much everybody, even your heroes. So Mary knew how much Twisted Sisters meant to me. She told Diane about me and I was invited to contribute to her new book, an anthology of autobio comics about the Me Too movement. What an honor. In 2019, Diane came to town to promote Drawing Power, and I got to be on a panel with her. I had told her previously over email, um, but I was happy to get to tell her in person how much her work has meant to me. Last year, Diane passed away. Someone told me that her, at her memorial, my name was brought up as someone who was profoundly affected by her work. I'm so glad I stuck around in comics long enough to thank her for everything she's done. Full circle. <laughs> So I guess the point of my talk is never give up on your dreams, even when they get stomped on repeatedly. It could all turn out great. Um, you can meet your heroes, and they might be wonderful. <coughs> Tosako, wonderful and charming. Or if it doesn't turn out great and your heroes turn out to be assholes, at least you failed at something you loved instead of something you hated. Or maybe you'll get banned in Texas, and everything will turn out fine. The end. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we're doing a Q&A. Do we have time? I, can't, I don't have my glasses on. Oh, geez, I went a little long, sorry. Um, but I think I could do a couple, maybe. Oh, there's the mic. Thank you. Uh, lovely, lovely time. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, over the years you had gotten people that discouraged you from doing stuff that was too ethnic at a certain point. And I'm always really curious, like, what are those conversations like? Like, what, what words, <laughs> what do they say? Like, what, what are those things like? Can you share? I mean, I feel like most of the time it, you can't put a pin in it. You're like, oh, you know, was I rejected because <clears throat> of something stupid I said at a party once? Or was I rejected because the work isn't good? Or it's whatever, not what they're looking for. But, like... That was one of the few times where I actually picked up on the code where they said not universal enough. And uh, I think you just have to, like, but that's the thing. Like, I, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. So I assume that if someone rejects me in dating, you know, love, life, friendship, whatever, with, like, publishing, like, I always think, oh, well, you know, they probably got good intentions. They're not a bigot or misogynist or homophobic or anything. But, like, every once in a while, you're just like, Man, <laughs> it's hard. I mean, if, if, if I didn't give benefit of the doubt, like people the benefit of the doubt, I think I would just get real bitter. But is this like in a conversation or an email or, or what is it? They told my editor, who is a woman of color, so I feel like she really picked up on it. Um, other times that I've known that I was being targeted for who I am versus like the work I've done, um, like in the video game industry, that happened a lot where... People would say, we just don't feel like a woman would fit into our team. Like, yeah. But it was never the, the hiring manager. It was always the people who were trying to get me in there. Like, I can't believe he said that. So, I mean, it's, it's rare that people will directly tell you to your face. But, um, yeah, I try not to think about it too much. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Oh. You also mentioned that you felt like there was a moment where the appetite or the market for autobio comics, especially by women, had kind of peaked. And I wonder if you still feel that or if something has changed and, you know, there were the few big names that everyone was reading. Um, but can you just say where you think women's auto or non-binary female identified autobio comics are now? It's hard um, to say. I feel like I was a lot more cognizant of where the market was um, when I was starting out because, like, I was really paying attention. But now I'm just doing my own thing. Um, and to my agent's chagrin, my own thing always is, like, what's something that hasn't been done before, which is the hardest thing to possibly sell. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, burying my own hole <laughs> or digging my own hole. Um, I do notice that right now the industry seems to be snapping up middle grade 
um, graphic novels. Like for a while, YA was the big hot thing. Um, it's like you can never guess where it's going to go. Um, I do think it's a little better now than it was right after my book came out um, when people are like, oh, wait, we're not going to make a billion dollars on comics. Um, so it's constantly changing, constantly. And like just like crazy rich Asians and fresh off the boat, like change things for Asian American cinema and TV. Like I feel like it's still holding and I feel like thank you everywhere, everything everywhere all at once, like really help prop it up, but like I've seen this happen with like lesbians who were in vogue for a second in the 90s, and that was so exciting to see like the lesbians on Newsweek. I, I kept that paper. <laughs> like I was, you know, they're fads, and then I'm, you know, then I'm just kind of cynically waiting to see when's this fad going to run, but maybe it's just the new normal. I hope, I hope, I hope. But then, you know, book bans, it's hard to say. <laughs> the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Well, me and Joe are going to be at Prairie Lights doing a signing. Oh, did you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to ask a bit about uh, your creative process and like you seem to have said something about maybe you, you would write first before drawing sometimes. Sometimes. Or how's that? Um, I don't know. Honestly, every book is different. Yeah. I'd switch it up. I like maybe I have just some form of like I can't I just can't do the same thing over and over again, which is why my books are all so just so different from one another. Um, because like I just want to constantly try new things. Um, that was the problem with losing the girl. They're like, oh, why don't you draw this in your old style? I'm like, but I've already done that. <laughs> I want to do something different. So yeah, every like this last book is just, I mean, it's just crazy and weird and like nothing else. And I assume my next book will be too, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Oh. You comment on uh, when you saw the anthology of the Diane Newman and how for you was very touching, like where short stories, different female, which other books and artists or elements are being influenced you? On, on, on the process of creating? Honestly, what type of music? What mm. type of readings? Uh, how do you see the, the, the other comics happening? Like, you know, because I read you all, uh, spoke a about lot. The, what? And I read a lot of comics and I take in a lot of media just, just to keep up with what people are doing and uh -huh. I, just, I just love them. Um, as far as being personally influenced, though, it's pretty rare. Like Cheryl Strayed was a big one. Um, Ariel Bordeaux and Mary Fleener were big ones, um, but but those were at just pivotal moments where I'm like, oh, I could do that. Like, and and I feel like those are the real influences. Um, like Edward Gorey was a huge influence, but I don't draw like Edward Gorey. I wish, but I don't. Um, uh, but like just, but it was a sense of humor or like the Far Side. Like the sense of humor was an influence, but 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 yeah, it's really hard to pin. Um, because, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, I'm always trying to do something that's different than other people are doing. Again, much to my agent chagrin, um, it's, it's not the most lucrative way to do things. But um, And with the video games, you were speaking about the relationship with video games. There was something that you got from that experience with video games that... It was exciting, because at the time, video games were doing things that they weren't. Like, it, I, the big companies were like that were hiring me were doing new and exciting things I feel like that kind of stopped happening but I feel like now that's happening again with indie games um, but I haven't been in the game industry for like 12 years or something now um, I don't even play games anymore unless you count wordle <laughs> I didn't Once do my again, wordle I'll... last night it's because I'm traveling <laughs> yeah. oh no more streak all right <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I had another one. I'm wondering, have you gotten a lot of translations of your work? And if so, do other audiences kind of give you different feedback? I've gotten zero feedback. Um, so Turning Japanese got translated to French. Uh, right when the pandemic happened, they, I got the, the offer or whatever. And, I'm, and I was like, oh, no, they're going to use a pre-made font, aren't they? And so I offered to hand letter everything, um, even though I don't speak French. <laughs> was, so that's how I spent the first days of the pandemic, was just hand lettering the whole book again. Um, and I got some things on like Instagram, like people would retweet it and or tweet about it, but like I don't 
speak French, so I couldn't always figure out what they were saying, but I'm like, I hope they're good things. Um, I've had comics translated into Russian and German um, for like the queer ones especially. But yeah, once that happened, I never really heard about it. Um, so hopefully people liked it. The Russian one was kind of scary because you know they, they were having a queer festival in, a, in an area where it's not legal to be queer and I thought it was pretty bold of them to do. Looked cool, I hope they translated it correctly. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the really interesting talk. You mentioned a few times social media and like meeting people or networking via Twitter and or other platforms. And I was wondering if sort of what you thought of as the role of social media in your career or if those if you have like a particular approach to it or if things just sort of happen spontaneously there. Well, it changes. Like I, I studied really hard and try to figure out again. Like I, I went onto every platform to see, like, is this going to be helpful? Like, how can I get free marketing? And that's how I see social media. In addition to keeping in touch with friends and stuff, um, I recently soft quit Twitter. Like I'm back, but just to promote stuff. But I'm not really back. But I miss my friends on Twitter. But like, I just can't deal with how Elon Musk treats his employees, so I just can't in good faith like, go on there and give him like fun content. Um, it's really complicated. Like Sometimes I just want to quit it all, but then I miss my friends that I've made there, and I realize, oh, I don't, I don't see that guy's bug pictures anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Like I've been on social media since, I mean, the 90s, and AOL.com uh, or whatever, AOL, where... A woman convinced me that LOL meant lesbians online, and I believe that for like <laughs> a full week. <laughs> but I, the thing is, it's changing so much. And I actually, if you follow my social media, I, I talk a lot about it because I feel like, despite it changing all the time, there are certain things that you can do to t kind of beat the algorithm. And I think it's really important to share with other, especially new creators who are like trying to find their audience, like to show, well, you know, look. It's not because you suck that you're not getting a bigger audience, or maybe it is, but I mean, it's not usually, like, even people who suck can get a big audience. Like, like it, there's a very specific formula, and the problem is it's changing all the time, and it's super annoying that we live in this capitalist society where we have to figure out how to use these things, um, but, you know, I think it's great for free marketing, <laughs> but also it's evil, and um, it can really mess people up sometimes. I think the worst that social media has done to me personally was when I was doing the web comics and I just started worrying about what the audience would think of each co like comic. I was worried about not getting canceled, but like em revealing embarrassing things that would make people not like me. Um, but also by just doing it anyway, I was able to get over that. So it's hard to publish a comic that's auto bio where you're behaving like an asshole because like people won't like you, but like. But then maybe they will. Maybe they'll just, you know, relate because they're all assholes too. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, uh, thank you very much for sharing your amazing career with us uh, this <laughs> afternoon. It was very inspiring. I can hope I noticed uh, how different is the first comic book that you show us uh, to the final one. No, it's the first one is pretty traditional, and then. We have very experimentation throughout the books. So I wonder, um, are you like looking for a definitive style or something like that? And no. that's why you're experimenting or you're simply like trying new things every time you can and you're not really concerned with that, of finding an identity or whatever? Um, I'm not really concerned about it. In fact, I don't really consider myself having a style. Um, and the only reason I know I have is because people tell me I do. Um, but it's almost like body dysmorphia. It's like body of work dysmorphia, where I'm like, I'm just trying to make it look like the thing that I'm drawing and trying to make it not confusing. Like, I want you to know what's happening with those avocados. So, like, how do I make this simply? Um, but then ultimately, you know, if you, it's, it's like handwriting. I feel like a, an art style is almost like your handwriting style. Of course, my handwriting's all over the place, like a serial killer, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think about it too much. Um, I know a lot of people when they start are trying to imitate people, um, which I don't know if that works because I didn't really, I've, I've done that 
fairly recently um, just to see what it would feel like. And it was weird. It was like trying on someone's underwear. Like I didn't, I didn't like it, but I kind of liked it. I don't know. It was, was kind of weird. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I can't attest to how much that worked. But like when I, by the time I started drawing comics, though, like I already felt like I had my own style. Like I was not looking. I was just trying to make it more simple to look at. Or be, I just don't want people to be confused when they read my comics. That's my ultimate goal. I'm just, yeah, I, I don't consider myself really an artist. I just happen to draw nine books. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mary Naomi, for this sincere presentation that we really enjoy. And now is the opportunity to all of us move on to Prairie Lights.